Welcome to the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. I'm Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. I will be co-interviewing this interview with the director of the Bronx County Historical Society, Stephen Payne. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm um, Stephen Payne, the director of the Bronx County Historical Society, and uh, looking forward to uh, this oral history um, one and hopefully what will become many oral histories with 15, 20 Sedgwick uh, residents. Um, yeah. Great, great. Today is Wednesday, October 16th, 2024, and we are joined by Gerald Leader, also known as DJ Jerry D, a resident who grew up his entire life at 1520 Cedric Avenue. Welcome, DJ Jerry D. Introduce yourself. Hey, please. Pat, how you doing? My name is Gerald Leader. AKA DJ Jerry D. I am a DJ from Cedric Avenue, 1520. Awesome, awesome. We like to begin all of the oral histories out by asking you about your parents. Can you talk to us a little about each? Where do they come from and how they got to the Bronx? Uh, my mother and father, they met at a teenage age, I believe in Harlem. And, you know, they got married at a young age and they had nine kids together. Um, I'm the baby boy of the family. Uh, I got six other sisters and two other brothers. Uh, it was uh, a beautiful thing as being a young, because you get to be coached by not just your mother, but by, by your older brothers and sisters too as well. Um, a lot of Christmas presents, yes, I got that. So uh, we are uh, mother originally from Harlem and my father as well, and they are, uh, moved to the Bronx when I was about three years old. I think we had a family fire and we had to uh, relocate from that fire building and we found, fit, the mother found 1520 Cedric, moved in uh, 1970 year. And uh, this is three years before the start of hip hop. So we were one of the first residents of this building, 1520 Cedric Avenue, moving in in 1970. I can remember families like the Campbells and the Stricklands on that came in. Uh, maybe they're there around the same time that we were there, but uh, the Cantons. But uh, it was great growing up with those families out of that building in the early years. And when the, the Campbell family, uh, Cool Herc's family, moved in the building, uh, they were there in the early years as well. Herc was doing these parties in the early 70s in the park area of 1520 and uh, Jason Building, 1600 Cedric. And there where I started getting involved in what they called hip hop years later as a youth in that park. Uh, a lot of people talk about the 1520 Cedric infamous community room party that happened August 13, 1973. Um, that was an adult party and I was a kid, so I wasn't at that party, but I was at the parties before that in the park uh, uh, of the building uh, 1520 and, and after that party too as well, Hercules to be in the park. And I did my break dancing before the cardboards and the knee pads for a cool Herc in that park with other friends from the building. Yeah, I remember. Awesome, awesome. This kind of brings you back a little. Where do your parents come from originally? Are they originally yeah, from? Familiar, Harlem, yes. Harlem? Harlem, yes. From Harlem, yes. My mother, Harlem resident. My father, I believe he's from Canarsie, Brooklyn, but he, okay. he stayed in Harlem most of the time. And uh, Original New Yorkers. Yeah, New Yorkers, yes. Awesome, awesome. And uh, do, do you remember life during elementary school at 1520 Subject Avenue, going to school, coming back from school? What was it like in that community? Oh, wow. Uh, it was a lot of unity in that community back in those days of me going to junior high and elementary school. Um, Cedric Adams kind of uh, off the range a little bit because it's down in this valley area. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of stores or any merchants in the area. When I say merchants, as far as that, you know, from pharmacies to discount stores to clinics to cleaners, none of that was on Cedric Avenue. Today, still no merchants on that block. You got to go a little further up a hill or some steps to get to where the stores and stuff is at. So growing up on 1520 in a neighborhood with no merchants was kind of hard to go get candy, you know. So what I did as a kid, 
Uh, what all kids used to do was have little skateboards. Before they were motorized, we used barbarian wheels. <laughs> <laughs> and those barbarian wheels took me to places off the block. Um, and the motor that we actually used for the skateboard, besides kicking and pushing, was just to grab onto the back of one of the local buses and then it take you up the hill or take you down the block. Uh, and I used to love to grab onto that three bus on University Avenue and take me to Fordham Road so I can collect comic books and baseball cards and, and hold onto the back of the bus and get home. And trust me, it sounded dangerous, but it was totally safe. <laughs> <laughs> now, 1520 Cedric Avenue, right? Uh, you know, it, it's a lot different from the tenements and the New York City Housing Authority projects. Right. The economic status or yeah. level of the residents there were not poor, impoverished yeah. families. Yeah. You know, they were more middle class. Yeah, please explain to us about your neighbors mm, and some yes. of the jobs that they had. Oh, the, oh, yes, the middle class was definitely a uh, residence in uh, 1520. It was an 18 story uh, building with terraces, and we had a doorman, we had a candy machine, soda machine, and a telephone in the lobby of the building. Um, we had a doorman too as well, who was very liked by mostly all the tenants in the building. I remember down there in the valley area, like 1520, uh, doormen used to participate in some of the games that we played outside from the building, from racing from one end to another, to uh, playing tag. Uh, we were like family, um, so to say. Uh, uh, I remember a lot of uh, hard-working mothers going to work and coming home from work while I'm outside playing in front of the building with their children as my friends and stuff like that. And, uh, oh, it was a lot of people. Were. Now, my family, she raised nine, you know, but um, we were, our families helped, honestly to say, you know, public sisters did help feed my family in of nine back in the day. Yes, it did. Um, but majority of the people in 1520 were working class people, and a lot of my friends, uh, when they get out of school at 3 o'clock, uh, instead of me going straight home, I can go to their house before their mother come home for work and hang out. <laughs> 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 you know, so it, it, it was good. The fathers were there, too. We had a lot of fathers. A lot of the fathers hung out together in the building, as so to say. Um, years ago, there were the, the music genre was, was doo-wop music. I remember my father and most of the other people fathers in the buildings all sang doo-wop outside the building or in the park. Or when we take a neighborhood community trip to Coney Island, they sung a lot of doo-wop on the train uh -huh. um, riding to Coney Island in the back car with all the families that was going. So I have um, togetherness is the word I use for hip-hop in my early years growing up at 15, 20 because the neighborhood was clean. We had no gangs. We had, uh, we loved each other. And they said, uh, like I said, it takes a village to raise a, a, a person. Well, it, a, a village did raise me because we all were together, and they stared me right and didn't allow me to get in trouble. When I was in trouble, I would get a spanking by them, taken upstairs and get a spanking again by my mother. So uh -huh. that's how I was raised. There was no talking back, cursing. There was no uh, even giving bad posture to someone older than me. You know, people wasn't afraid to discipline you. Not to hurt you bad, but they used to discipline you where well, you felt that and you remind you not to talk back to certain people again. So I was raised like that. And um, and like I said, my neighborhood took good care of me. They didn't just have to discipline me because I wasn't one of the bad kids. Some of the kids needed that discipline, but um, they did uh, share time. Um, they did play sports with me. They did uh, participate in things that it, it just took other people to get involved. And we did all that community. So. It was a nice, clean, clean hip hop uh, stage before it got to develop in other neighborhoods, so to say. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, can you talk to us about some of those games you played as a kid in your oh, neighborhood? We had so much. Uh, one of my favorites called uh, Kick the Can. When you kick the can and you run around the bases like you're playing baseball, we had Ringa Levy. I'm sure a lot of kids remember that game. Uh, we played a lot of things. We, we used to climb pyramids on top of each other. We used to uh, build clubhouses up in a tree. I don't know if you remember things like that. We used to get some, somebody was good in wood, it was, uh, put some wood together and build a house up in a tree for us to hang out at. Not too far up in a tree, but just enough to put a little three-step ladder to get in there. Um, we played uh, tag. We played uh, uh, kiss and tell. Can't forget that. Yeah. When we had abandoned cars, uh, cars on the block years ago, back in the 70s, 
where you can hide in the abandoned car. And if you find a girl in the abandoned car, guess what you're doing? You're getting a kiss. <laughs> 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 it won't happen so much by the tree or the bushes, but if you catch her in a van the car, it was all good. You're going to get a kiss, you know, and that's about it. But, yeah, I remember playing those type of games and Skelsies, of course, and, and uh, uh, stickball and catch. And, and uh, we had we had uh, games where we could play together before PlayStation. We we had this game. I said, love. I had my own game. It's called uh, Rock'em Sock'em Robot. Uh -huh. It was two guys and two uh, mechanical monsters in a, in a ring. And you have your inner how inner, and we would press some buttons for them to punch each other. And whoever head goes up first, the one that lost the fight, I played that game. Everybody in my neighborhood, when I took it out, soccer, this is one of my favorite games. Rock of Soccer Robot. <laughs> nice, nice. Now, nine siblings. Yes. That had to have been. Your older siblings were cooking back then, also, I'm assuming. No, they couldn't mess with my mother. My mother was Talk the best us, cook ever I had in my mind all my life. When I get old, I'm going to buy her a kitchen and cook in a restaurant. Because she was, oh, and she cooked that real good southern food, too. I'm talking about stuff that you probably never heard of or didn't even, always want to taste it, but never had it. Food like turnips mm -hmm. and, and um, squash and, and uh, oh, this red rice with, with, with sausage and uh, this different type of food. She was always good and she cooked for nine. So you know, it wasn't on little pot on that stove. She had the big restaurant <laughs> pots cooking collard greens and she never bought frozen collard greens. She used to sit down on the couch and she used to cut the greens off the stems from fresh mm -hmm. greens. Um, always just tell me don't eat everybody's cooking, you know, because you can't trust everybody's food. People don't clean their food. And she did a lot of cleaning. She did a lot of good. She fed nine. And we all came out big bonus. So she did her job. Trust me, <laughs> she was the cook of the family. Yes. Got it, got it. Now, I do understand that a lot of your siblings took you out to parks and you heard a lot of music mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. But at home, mm -hmm. what music was your mother and father playing? They that influenced played. your siblings and you. It was between both, outside park jams and what my mother and father played in the house. My father used to drink a lot, but he used to love music, always wanted to dance. He was a short guy, but he was a funny guy and well loved in the neighborhood because uh, he had nine kids too. Um, but they loved record. Between my family and the next door neighbor, the Collins and other people, we used to share records. I remember my mother letting them hold five albums. They let us hold five albums. The next week we'll get back to five albums and take another five. We used to share records, do things like that. I don't know if people do that, but we did that. We shared records. And uh, I remember listening to a lot of, you know, from Gladys Knight and to Motown records to uh, just uh, Wilson Pickett to uh, all those soulful songs came from my mother and father. They had nine kids, so they had company. You know, they, you know, they knew people that should, uh, pay attention to them because they had so many kids and would come over to the house and hang out and they had their living room parties you know all the kids all of us being in the back they had the boys room had the girls room the parents we had three bedrooms but the living room her company come home and they used to play record and I used to listen and I'm going to tell you a story this is so funny how I knew I was going to grow up to be a DJ when Herc and them used to play in the park and I lived on the 17th floor overlooking the park and hearing the music. And it was times I couldn't go outside. Maybe I was on punishment or something, whatever. It was times, and I used to sit on that terrace and listen to Herc playing the park from my terrace. I was one of those kids, as you already know by now, I probably collected with the comic books and the uh, baseball cards. I had built my own makeshift DJ equipment as a kid, right? Two cereal boxes, laid them flat. I cut out paper records by putting paper over a record and cut around a record. I had paper plate records. I had uh, sticks from ice cream cones as the needle. I had another box in the middle as a mixer and aluminum foil on a stick as a crossfader. I had my own makeshift DJ equipment and paper plates records. Now, I didn't know what the name of the record was they was playing down there. So every paper plate record that I beatboxed and imitated when I played it, I had my own name for it. For example, uh, Eisenberg had a record um, called Want to Get Into Something. But on the record, he's constantly saying, follow me, follow me, until it gets to the break part. 
I didn't know it was called Guinness Receptor. I called that record Follow Me for the next 40 years before I realized <laughs> that's not the name of the song. But it takes me back to my paper plate records when I had to imitate names for certain songs that I was just hearing and just knew that sound, that music, and it stuck to me as a as a DJ growing up. All these records I had to hear from the park, from the terrace or in the park, or my mother and father's playing in the house. When they played those Marvin Gaye records, or I used to hear my mom with this, oh, I love this record, and all these songs, that stuck with me, you know, because she had her favorites too, you know. Um, so it was a combination of home and the park um, music, and the park played some of my parents played, and even more because it was stretching the culture to, to a new genre to become something that we all enjoy today, Koya Pop. I'm going to ask you a couple questions before we get into the 1520 community thing. You know, what was it like? What was their dress like in the 70s? How did they look? What were they wearing? You're still a kid, though. You know? I remember. You know, what, what were the adults in the... You know? I think fashion played a big part of hip-hop, too. It was a swag thing. I mean, it was not a dress code, but it was something that made you feel like you was on top of your game when it came to hip-hop, the way we dressed. It was called setting trends, uh, along with the dances we came up with besides break dancing, dances like the Patty Duke, the Spank, the Hustle, you know, kind of joined hip hop to where it was at those uh, block parties as well. So it was other uh, uh, trends being set, and fashion is one of the biggest ones. As a b-boy, it was certain clothes we wore to identify ourselves as b-boys. Uh, it goes from having uh, permanent creased jeans to having a uh, graffiti uh, uh, painted on the back of your jacket to the way you wore your Kango hat, wearing gazelle glasses, to, if you can remember, putting a sock and folding it up and putting it in the tongue of your sneaker with fat shoelaces it was a part of a dress code of being a b-boy. You know, um, Lee jeans, sham shirts, Mock necks, uh, all this was stylish clothes for hip hop guys that was into what they were doing in the parks back in the days. Um, AJ Lessers played a big part as a Storm on 25th Street that dressed before Dapper Dan, that dressed hip hop if you want to dress nice. You know, uh, from, like I said, from the Mock necks to, uh, uh, to um, they had them, them silk shirts and overlap pants and, and, and uh, AJ pants with the stitch on the side. All that played a part, British Walker shoes, Playboy shoes. This was all fashion. This was all part of what was being worn by hip hop. Neighborhoods, um, not solely the same when being worn you know, around the world. Um, I, had, I got a classic pair of Playboy shoes and um, I was in California. They just identified the Those That's New York, like they know. And Playboys and British Walkers and all that, we was wearing those in New York. And for that to be a throwback, other states recognized that. So, yes, the fashion was really, really strong. And I always wanted to be a part of hip hop by doing stuff like putting uh, painting on the back of my jacket. And if we could go far back, do you remember the Delhi News on a Sunday would give you this page where you can take the page out and you can put it on the back of your jacket and iron on? a print on your jacket from the newspaper. Do you ever go that far back? I do. Sunday papers, we used to get a picture of something. I'll give you a celebrity, anybody, and we was able to, it's called an iron on. And you can iron on your clothing or whatever just from the newspaper itself with a hot iron. Those, those are the good old days, hip hop. And the cereal box used to give you free records, a free Mike, a Jackson 5 record as a prize before they start putting them little cheap little things in there. We used to get records you can cut out the back of the uh, cereal box. Trust me, I know. That's that's old school right there, hip-hop. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. You, what middle school did you go to? I went to CIS 229, which is almost a mile away from 1520 Cedric, if you walk it. It was probably .9 or something like that. Just short of a mile. And the reason why I say that is because I tried to get a bus pass to go. They said, you got to live a mile or more from the school. And I just fell short. So I had to walk that long <laughs> Cedric Avenue block because I was just .9 away from the school instead of one mile. I couldn't get a bus pass. And back in the days, you couldn't just get on a bus. 
like they do now. That bus driver said, get off the bus. He would, he would stop the bus or he would make everybody get off the bus if you don't get off the bus. They didn't play that back in them days. You got to have your pass or you ain't going to school or you walk. And that's crazy because you would think they'd be considered for a kid that went to school. They didn't do that. My parents told me about when they went to school, they had to walk miles and miles and, and, and were barefooted, okay, in the dirt to get to the nearest school. No buses or nothing to get them. So, you know, that, that story being told to me, I was like, okay, I'll do this mile. Wow. Um, so a uh, couple questions, just backtracking a little before we keep moving forward with 1520. Um, you just mentioned your, your parents right now having to walk miles to their schools. Uh, did you ever as a child, like, did you have grandparents that lived, you know, maybe down south still or anything like that? Did you well, visit them ever? My, my mother, my grandmother lived in Harlem. Okay. In, your, your in the Lincoln Harlem, Project too. area. Okay. And my great grandmother, I think she lived in Queens or Brooklyn. My father's from Canarsie, so their parents is from 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 here too. I okay. mean, they their culture, they, you know, I got a little West Indian on my father's side, you know, so probably back in his culture, this probably goes back to the St. Lucia, St. Croix. But as far as me growing up and them growing up, I believe it was right here in the city. You know? Okay, yeah. So all your family was in the mm -hmm. city. Um, did you go and, and visit your family in other parts of the city very, well, we very are, much? Well, we are pretty much 50 and over now, believe yeah, it or yeah, not, yeah, all yeah. of us, you know. All nine of us are 50 and over. It's the grandkids that's coming up on 50s now. And yeah. That's crazy. I wish my mother and father was here to see that. But uh, um, the family, they, they like to say, like, they did their job already. And they started their life, you know, moving on. Older brothers, sisters that had careers, they done moved on. But we know we keep in touch by phone. Some don't speak to others and all that stuff still goes on to every family. But, uh, you know, we all just know we all love each other. When it comes to all of us coming together, we will. Yeah. But um, my family's pretty much big. I have an older brother who joined the uh, Navy and um, pretty much did his entire life there, 40 some years in the service. and. I lost one brother. So out of the nine of us, seven of us are still living. I lost a sister and I lost a mm -hmm. brother. And the seven still living, we try to stay close, you know. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that you would take your skateboard like up to Fordham Road for comic books mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Would you go to other parts of the Bronx? Like would your mom take you shopping for clothes anywhere? Yes. Her area of shopping with me, I mean locally it was University Avenue because that's the nearest store, it's yeah. just to, to Cedric. But as far as shopping for clothing and, and, and food and stuff, she she uh, traveled away, away, away. Uh, her choice was 3rd Avenue, 149th Street. Uh -huh. Back in the 70s, there was a lot of stores were still had the popular clothes. I think they had Alexander's on 3rd Avenue back in the days, too. Yeah, 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 that's right. And, and they also had Alexander's on Fordham Road, which was the chosen uh, department store for all families. Uh, besides Corvette, that's right. That was a department store like Maze on 14th Street, in Manhattan. People went to, uh, but her choice was uh, it was different. And we had a Shopwell supermarket, and that we went to. Um, but Fordham Road and One Four Next was a place of getting food and shopping and stuff like that. First, I can remember. And as far as other other families that lived in 1520, um, what was like uh, the the makeup were there? Um, like Jamaican families in the building, other Caribbean. It was most. Like. Yeah, it was some. It was few, few, and very few. I would say at, in the beginning it was just one family in Puerto Ricans. Okay, yeah. Just one family. They was known. Some of them were gang members and stuff, but they were part of our family too in the beginning. Beginning, um, Jamaicans, yes. Uh, not too much of doing cultural Jamaica things in the neighborhood, but there was some family show sure, that that come from the Jamaican side of, of things. Um, we all uh, pretty much was the black American families down there. Yeah, sure. And uh, you know, from all us going to school together, the same school together, living in the same building, you know, uh, hip hop has grown to where when we was doing down there, a lot of people didn't know about it. And how the people got to know about what we're doing down there is from um, us going to separate schools, uh, junior high school, there was school 82 on University Avenue, that was in our district, 229 I went to, 109 I went to the elementary school. When we went to different schools, especially the older ones with the high school, they told their friends, yeah, we, every weekend we got this guy cool work down, he's rocking, come and hang out with us. 
and people started coming to us. And surprisingly, the most people that came were like maybe dating one of the girls from our block or, you know, something like that. And they, they became part of the family with us. Like, yeah, your boyfriend's cool. You know, he's playing basketball in the park with us. You know, he's out there with us every weekend. So he became part of the family. So people started coming to the block, became part of the family. Where Central Park got a little too small for all that. And we had to move it further down the block to Cedar Park, uh-huh. which is down uh, maybe a mile and a half away from the from the building where it hold a larger crowd. And then once that happened, it just, it, it kind of inv- invited other people from the neighborhood that were up to no good already in their neighborhood. And, and he was invited to come and join our circle. And that's when violence and stuff started getting involved in the clean hip hop we started. It wasn't just us anymore. You know, this guy's from this girl from our building who date this guy, his friend is acting crazy now. Or, you know, these dudes waiting to rob people down the block and all that stuff. And they from other side of town, you know. And once that started happening, we didn't know because we wasn't doing that with each other. Yeah. But we were aware just from going to outside schools, neighborhoods that this does happen. But thank God it never came too close to home. It started happening on Cedar Park. It never happened in Cedric Park, the clean years, 73 to 77, it's been non-violent. And still years after that, never really been nothing happened on Cedric, but that Cedar Park got a history of a lot of, uh, of fatalities, so to say. And all the other parks that, like, it was happening in the neighborhood, 183rd Street or whatever, Pole Park, it was just things happening that didn't happen on Cedric Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you want to talk a little bit more about what your experience was like in elementary school and in um, junior high school, 229? It was fun because we, when growing up in junior high school, they had just built the River Park Towers and the Roberto Comente State Park. So on the grounds of the Bird Place of Hip Hop, we also had a state park. Uh, facility, recreation center. We had a big swimming a pool. pool right? We had yeah. a diving swimming pool. Mm. We had handball courts. We had we played ping pong. We had indoor basketball court and basketball team. We had uh, a place that we could practice football. And, and we it was a definitely a recreational area when it came to them putting that Roberto Comente State Park there, which is right beside my junior high school. Mm. I remember in June and getting close to School's almost over in the last couple of weeks. Instead of me going to class, I was going down in the pool. Yeah, 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 yeah. The pool opened up before school was open. We got the win of it. We you know we know we get promoted anyway. You know, some of us got report cards. We didn't know. You know, we going to miss few days, but we were able to do that back in the days. But we went down to that pool, or we went down in the towers and we played ping pong, we played basketball, and you know, um, it was fun growing up with the kids in the neighborhood because they all were on the same level I was. We got good music. We got each other. You know, we got place we can have competition sports with each other. You know, we had a black principal at that time, Mr. Johnson was there for years. Um, it was just, everybody was on the same page that came from that area, you know. We had a couple of crazy people out of Real Park Towers, so I ain't gonna lie, there were some people, but they were known for being crazy with people outside the neighborhood. Uh-huh. You know, they might've watched their own. And some of them did slip and hurt some of their own, but maybe he deserved it, who knows. But we, the thugs we had, they, they was known for having their business outside the neighborhood. And they had big names outside the neighborhood. But um, growing up with the kids, we were fun. It was all fun because we, we were break dance. It wasn't a competition. We were a group, you know. Um, if, if we were in DJing, we were just involved with the culture as far as supporting the parties or make sure you wear the latest fashion. If you came outside and the girls got on certain hip-hop clothing, you right then and there, you know, you, you're hip hop, you, you, you're there with us, you're, you're, you're good, you know. Um, it was a vibe thing, it was a swag thing, it was uh, just, everybody was on the same page when it came down to what we all, how we were living. And um, I can recall just uh, not even having fights and just having breakdance standoffs with um, someone, uh, people that I didn't like or didn't like me, we didn't, we didn't have to fight, we, uh, we had a breakdance uh, competition at the next block party and whoever lose you lost that means you leave the party that means you lost whatever it is you're fighting for whether it was a girl or whatever it was you had to stand um, stand respect after a breakdance battle so um, those are the years that I lived you know? and it kind of saved a lot of lives too because we didn't have to 
fight with you know knives and chains and guns. We just had a breakdance battle, um, which I think I mentioned before that um, it's kind of a concept that Michael Jackson used in that bad video, where he had two gangs in the subway system beating up, and um, instead of them, you know, it was kind of meeting them like it was the Warriors or something, but they met up instead of fighting. They had a breakdance competition, and it reminded me of that was the way we handled things in the parks back in the days. A lot of people don't talk about that into uh, Hollywood with it, with these videos and stuff, uh, a concept that was really happening in the streets of the Bronx with, with each other's, you know? Nice. Do you remember um, what the first time you met Herc was? Was it at one of the parties? Was it just in the building? I mean, you might have been really That's young, a good so question. That's a good question, but I can't really say when I first met him. You see somebody every day, you don't know when you first met him. And I met him at a... At a young age, I was a kid. You know, he's 10, 11 years older than me. So, um, I, if you do the math, I can help you do it real quick. I'm, I'm born in 67. Herc started in 73. Well, they say he started in 73. So, you got to give me at least six years old to be your first day. You know what I mean? So, but I wouldn't say the first day I met him, or I've seen him. I knew his father more than I knew him because his father was the one that was like twice her size and was the one that was being well respected neighborhood because he was a big Jamaican man and he talked with uh, so much force and aggression and, and a lot of people in the neighborhood did not mess with who, who Herc's father. He was a big guy. He didn't play around. Uh, but it, it's like I kind of feel like I when I was growing up, I didn't have no problems with nobody because I was a good kid anyway. So whatever fear I had, I, it was all because the act of another person, whether because I was being uh, uh, looking to do something bad to see anybody, you know. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, we'll get even more into um, early hip hop in in a second, but um, but just another question about your family kind of upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, did was your family very religious? Was there a church in the neighborhood that your family went to or another kind of place of worship, anything like that? I love my mother for that because she never took us to church, but she had a strong way of being spiritual on a Sunday. There was rules in the house when it came to Sunday. Uh, she played gospel music on the radio throughout the house every Sunday. Wake up the gospel music or gospel preacher talking or whatever station she listened to from an AM station. So, you know, it was kind of distorted too, but it was, you could hear the, 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 the pastor talking. So, um, we had that, then she set rules on, on Sundays and she's always contradict herself because she's always saying nobody can curse on a Sunday, but she's doing most of the cussing on Sunday, arguing with her kids. Uh, we couldn't play any music Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. One of, the, one of the rules that she made that, that I never heard nobody else do, but we did in our house, we couldn't iron clothes on a Sunday. Uh -huh. And that was kind of weird that that was her rule. No iron clothes. Whatever we needed for Monday morning, you better get it done Saturday. There was no pulling the iron board that the whole family shared out the kitchen. Iron clothes on a Sunday. Never happened. Um, and it was weird because she used to wash all our clothes and sometimes she used to bleach our color clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and our clothes be wrinkled too, but you know, Back in the days, you, you dress, you dress, you know. Uh, so, yeah, we had rules. She was religious on her stations most of the day, her, re, uh, her religious stations, and uh, she had set rules, and she always cooked the Sunday dinner all the time. She was probably start from Saturday night, from, you know, marinating meat to all type of stuff. So she uh, she was heavy into, she was a homebody. She's home every day. She cooked, you know, she cleaned, and she raised her kids. She raised nine kids. She did a good job because we all grew up trying to be something and nobody grew up to be, you know, off, off, off the chain. So I appreciate her because she ruled the house with iron fist. She was the mother and father. She ruled the house. She, my father had nine kids by her, but boy, she tamed him like she was one of his, like he was one of the kids. Um, <laughs> a hard, good fight, but he never, he never fought her back. He right. loved to wrestle her, hold her down. You know, and she was the violent one. She's yeah. the one that whipped all of our butts growing up. She was the, she was like Al Sharpton slash uh, Fred Flintstone slash Ralph Cramden, all in one. <laughs> Trust me. And would curse anybody out. And she owed nobody mess misleader because she had nine kids and she was very aggressive and she was a tall woman. She was about 5'11". 
but she was very tall and very mean. When I say mean, like, she didn't play. She was straightening you out, don't even know you. I wish she was here today. She pull one of these kids, pull your pants up. Don't you know we can see all your and make you feel like, yeah, I need to put my pants up. <laughs> or tell a girl in a minute, why you got all your, you want some man to come around the corner and rape you or pull you to the side? You better, you gotta present yourself with a little class. She would tell people like that and people would not go against her. They would look her like, this lady is crazy, but she's telling the truth. And a lot of people disrespect her because of that. And she talked loud. Like, you don't want to have a yelling match with her. She was just too much. Anyway, my mother was so much a Leo the Lion, and she ruled with Iron Fist, and she raised nine kids. She did a damn good job on raising me. And I would say a lot of people in the neighborhood, too, she had to straighten out. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't ask you about your high school. You didn't elaborate. Can oh, you I went, yeah, I went to uh, Samuel Gompers High School. That's the same high school Grandmaster Flash went to. Uh, same school that Keith Keith from the Funky Four, he's a hip hop rapper from uh, from that group. Uh, Fruit, uh, Tim Dog, a few other people, Chris Lighty, uh, that went to school with uh, in that and in, in Sammy Gompers High School. I loved that high school. It was a, a vocational and techno high school, and I was taking up a biz machine repair trade. I was fixing typewriters and repairing them um, um, machines, copy machines and stuff, and they became instinct because they came with computers and all that stuff now so there's now there's no more typewriter there's keyboards now um, but I used to take apart a typewriter put together in my high school um, trade um, I love my high school that's why I met my um, you know my high school sweetheart uh, my daughter's mother who uh, uh, almost 40 years ago uh, we had a baby um, that school was we was very good in uh, sports too as well I was uh, Sammy Gompers Panther basketball team. Uh, we took Class B championship in '85. Uh, it was a good school. It was also a South Bronx school that was kind of dangerous in its own kind of way too, because it was in an industrial area, and uh, you know it was a lot of bad kids in the school. But you know I was pretty much protected. When I thank God I never got into any trouble, fights, or anything. I was well liked in that school up to my senior year. Um, but it was a very uh, different experience for me because it, it showed me how to travel because it was in the South Bronx, far away from home. And I had to take buses to school. I met people along my bus routes that went to other schools and it was just a growing nature. And um, just knowing that uh, people know that I come from Cedric Avenue and a lot of people that I'd known from just being in their parks years ago on my skateboard, uh, making friends, uh, it was a lot of togetherness and, and until um, certain people, you know, try to spoil it with organizations and, and crews and stuff to try to regulate or I should say try to make you feel validated to walk the streets of the Bronx. And uh, I, I was able to go around all that and live a good life. Cool. Uh, any names that we would recognize that shared those hallways with you at Samuel Gompers? Yeah, uh, well, like I mentioned, I mentioned Tim Dog, who was a rapper. Uh, uh, he's the first rapper to battle West Coast rappers as a retaliation from West Coast trying to disrespect us, Tim Dog. F. Compton was the name. Uh, we also had Grandmaster Flash, who was the the, the, the DJ, so say, created the, the scratch or, or created cutting and, and other things with hip hop elements. Uh, he went to Sammy Gompers. He was into uh, uh, elect electricity, electrician. Um, he did a lot of wiring and all that, so he was able to take apart record players and mixers and all that stuff and create what he called the crossfader and things like that. So I, I went to school with uh, Chris Lighty. He was also the responsible guy at Def Jam that signed a lot of artists to to music uh, 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 companies like Jungle Brothers, LL Cool J, Busta Rhymes. He had his violated records where he had 50 Cent on it. So he passed away not too long ago, but he went to school with me too. It's a few more other people that went to school. I can't think of the top of my head right now, but we had, uh, we was a Bronx school and um, a lot of uh, old school 80s and 90s when I was going to high school, um, I should say 80s, um, a lot of upcoming rap and artists in all the schools because we all were teenagers all together. We had school jams and school battle. It'd be Roosevelt High School versus Taft High School. It'd be, you know, not just in sports, it'd be in DJs and stuff like too. Um, Sammy Gompers was just, at that time, that we used to be all boys school, by the way. It used to be all boys school and Jane Adams was all girls school. 
And that was the brother and sister school that was near each other that we used to go have dances with uh, at the end of the year or certain field trips, it'd be Gompers, you know, boys and girls together on trips. So that was our other school. And then I think the last couple of years there, it went co ed where they was allowing girls come to the school. And I think Clinton High School used to be all boy. They started girls going to that school. And you know, all the schools became co ed, but it used to be separate before. But Sammy Gompers was a very, very, um, very, very good school for uh, a trade. And I got to give it to Flash because what he learned or what he was doing in his high school, you know, it, it took his career in DJing to, to, to the biggest heights. You know? Were there uh, many other people from 1520 Sedgwick that went to Gompers with you? Um, no, I didn't have. I mean, Gompers, no. That's, yeah, that's a good yeah, question, yeah. too. You know, um, our zone school, that's the school they put you in when you, you fail or you get put out the school that, that was your choice. They put you in the zone school that the one closest to your house is where you're going to go. Uh, Taft High School was my zone school. So a lot of peop- guys that were in my, grew up in my neighborhood went to Taft High School. Uh, you know, some of them went to other schools. And when they went to other schools, you can tell what school was a good school by the person in your neighborhood that attended it was turning out to be. I had maybe four or five people in my building that went to Mary Bertram High School in the bottom of Manhattan. And me knowing how good Bertram was just from having my friends from the neighborhood going to attending that school and realized like 90-something percent of their kids graduate, okay, and became good, you know, silver workers or, or whatever, good people. And, you know, Stuyvesant Town, uh, Bronx High School of Science, uh, it was other big schools that some people from a neighbor went to that turned out to be graduates or be, have a good career in life because of those high schools. Um, I wanted to pick a school like, you know, a top notch school. Brooklyn Tech was also known as a good school too as well back in them days. Uh, just from education, the majority of people that graduate. Brandeis High School was one too as well. Um, I just knew people that went to those schools from a neighborhood and knew the difference between my high school and their school just from knowing that the, the, the people they be, was, was becoming to be from going to that school. Cause that's the transition right there, high school. Elementary, you're good, junior high. But when you go to high school, mm-hmm. college, you on your own. You can wild out. But high school is where you get all the information on what's going on, who's who, what's what. And um, my information on the schools, I definitely learned. Uh, how my school was and I, I appreciate my school was a trade school and we didn't have a high number of graduates but we had good number of people who did graduate had good careers because of the trade they learned from that school so if you wanted to learn that trade you want to be a carpenter or you want to work on elevators or whatever that was the school to go to you just got to graduate you can go from there you know and that was the advantage that I wanted to go to that school for but like as I told you before, my advantage went downhill when today's technology wiped out typewriters and replaced them with keyboards. Mm-hmm. And that was in my trade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so why don't you just take a little time to describe some of your earliest memories of the parties that were happening, you know, at Sedgwick uh, mm-hmm. Park. Um, I can only speak on the park party because I was a young kid. I can't tell you what's happening with indoor parties and from older DJs like D- my man DJ Hollywood and all that. Well, you had to have on shoes and come to his party. You try to come to his party, do that breakdown stuff, they're going to kick you out. They don't play that schoolyard stuff in those Hollywood and other classic DJs or parties. So my whole memory is on just the school parks uh, events and uh, the, the breakdance competition um, and watch it go from there. Now I can remember, like I said, break dance with my friends in the park and things like that and two other kids in the neighborhood started coming around. And I remember particularly these three Spanish brothers, Puerto Rican, I should say, came to the block. I think they was brought to the block by one of the local DJs that grew up with her and played in the park with her too. Brought these two, these three Spanish dudes down there from, I guess, Davidson Avenue, Grand Avenue. And they came down in to break dance with us. But they were doing gymnastic moves, flips, all type of stuff. And I'm looking like, 
you know, I, I was just doing footwork, you know, maybe spin on my head. But no, they were doing flips and gymnastics like they was an Olympic. I'm like, blew my mind. And right then and there, in my heart, if you can't beat them, you better join them. Or you're going to look stupid trying to go in competition with these guys on this block. And they were real light from the start. The crowd took to them. The DJs took to them. They named themselves Spider-Man, Spider-Web, and Beretta. Okay? There were three guys that was part of 1520. First B-Boys to help escalate what we were doing to the next level. Okay? Wow. Spider-Man, and they were young Spanish guys, and they were good. Now, we had other B-Boys coming into the game and doing things. It was pretty good, too, with the gymnastic. And, and they started escalating into where they started using props on their breakdance moves. You know, a toy this or a toy that. You know, pull out a corn like we did the other day. They, 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 we did that, you know. One dude had a makeshift penis. And he was dancing, he took a penis, shook it in the guy's face, and the guy came over and cut it off with the scissors, and then he just did a flip. And it was like a prop move to make you feel, you know, like, you know, you did something for the crowd. It was like entertainment. You know, it went to that level. And then we had them guys that came in there, and we had guys you probably heard of, like Trixie. Uh -huh. They called him Trixie because he had a lot of tricks when it came to we want to battle this guy. And stuff, you know, A B A B A one B boy Sasa also was a, a threat to the game with his moves and all that. Um, it was just uh, a thing where the neighborhood was appreciating the people that did come with it, that came with the, the talent and the skills and stuff like that. Like I said, I, I, I said I'll join you. I'm not gonna try to go against you. And then you've seen other kids doing even better in other neighborhoods, and then to develop and develop. And I'm telling you, the push for this, the motivation for these. Acrobatic moves came from the instrument in these beat boys break records. These songs had you doing things that you didn't imagine. You would take yourself out of this world and do something real crazy because of a certain song drummer or the, the, the bass or whatever percussion that was used. It could sometimes make you creative. I don't want to make it sense right now. But that's what it was. You know, just the music, the vibe, the sound. It made me do things that I didn't think I can do off the top of my head, off the back. Without even thinking about it, just doing flips and moves. The same thing was happening with the B-Boys and, and the elevation of it. When the music changed somewhat from the break beats being sampled and used and then moved up to the electrical uh, I should say electronica, uh, techno kind of like hip hop. And when I say that, I mean like the songs that came up in hip hop, like, for example, Africa Man by the Planet Rock, uh, Renegades of Funk. Uh, 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 it's a lot of records that came out produced by Arthur Baker that, that changed break dancing to popularize pop locking. And, and doing the wave and all the stuff that was added to what was really started as breakdance became, you know, a different type of uh, a way of dancing. And it was because of the music. It was the music that had the people doing the heartbeat and, and doing the wiggle and Mr. Wave doing his thing and all that. It was the tech, the music that was being played. So every hip hop had its phase of things. Dances changes. The, the, the genre kind of went here and there. And it, it just brung the energy out and made things being created to be a part of history just because of the sound that was being played by DJs and playing by um, uh, not so much the producers, but the, the choice of songs you play for people to do certain things, I would say, had to be the DJ. Uh, and that would create it hip hop and the dances to elevate to different levels and, and and to be what it is now. It was certain records you played and you started doing a hustle off the back. You were just break dancing. As soon as uh, this record came on, uh, Let's Get It Together by El Coco, you know, next thing you know, you dance and spinning and going around through the whole 12 minute disco record. It's the song. You control people's emotions, their mind, 
you control everything they do as a selector, a DJ. I'm saying that experience a DJ myself. You control everybody's feelings as a DJ. You play a slow record and you have people slow dancing, you got everybody feeling smooth and good. You did that just from what you played. You know? Before we get into your DJ, did you have a mentor in breaking? Someone you looked up to? Someone you practiced I with? I sucked. <laughs> That's right. That's I was going to leave it like that. I mean, I, I was okay. I was mediocre. But what they started doing, what they was getting to do, like, I mean, one guy looked like his head was on the left side of his body. That he he moved his body to the left and the head never moved. I, listen, I couldn't do all that. I just say, okay, I, it's entertainment for me now. But one thing that stuck with me was DJing. And I knew I was going to be DJ because I had the makeshift DJ equipment before I even had it on one record, you know? Um, I remember my mother had company sometimes early before it got dark. I was the selector. I would play records for the company she had sitting there before they even got time to leave the room. You know, I was always into the music thing and I had downstairs and upstairs surrounded. And then when I played by myself, because trust me, even though you had seven, eight other siblings, you still by yourself. Everybody in their own age group won't be bothered with people that's their age. They don't only really bother little Jeremy. They will use you if they can just to get out. Side, I'm taking Jerry with me, you know. My mom would think you babysitting me, even I'm in the park by myself and you doing what you know. But y'all know what y'all do, but that's just family. But I just knew that coming into this whole thing with, with, with hip hop, it was amazing. You have to live it and you have to know that everything was a vibe. It was, it was created and it went on just from the energy of the music that was being played. Yeah. Wow. So do you remember, um, you know, how you, maybe you were just always into it, but how, how did you first like get interested in, in, in dancing or, or do you remember like the first time that you started dancing? Yeah, in the neighborhood, the kids yeah. in the neighborhood, you know, we yeah. all did it together. It was like, you joined in, you know, if you didn't know how to dance, you was going to find out right then and there when you have a stand up for somebody, you did what you do. And just for me growing up with other brothers and sisters and watch what they doing, I kind of got a head start, you know, to what to do. Because some, you know, friends didn't have older brother, sister, or didn't have siblings at all. Um, I just just learned from what I saw from other people. It was part of just learning from other people's mistakes too. When you see them doing certain things, you know, uh, and I can say that I can remember a lot of things that my older brother, sister don't even remember. I've seen you remember this and I don't remember. You remember we had a dog in the house? I don't remember that. You don't remember the dog? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like they, they, they don't go far back. They said I'm the only one that keep refreshing their memory with the past because I was the one sitting there watching while you was living it. And you're not really looking from the outside because you're inside. But with someone looking from the outside, I seen everything that you did. I seen everything Herc was doing. I seen what everybody in the neighborhood was doing. I'm just watching because I hadn't. that was my job. I had nothing else better to do. But watch y'all. Meanwhile, you're, you're in action. You're doing your thing. You ain't paying attention to your mistakes or what you was doing. And I was taking lessons from that. And um, not to mention, um, I've been congratulated and uh, awarded for my for what I've done for my community because there at 1520, um, uh, I've been involved with the building. Uh, even though I moved out, I've been giving back to that building for the last 17 years uh, by doing uh, events for, for the neighborhood. Wow. Um, and do you remember what what are some of the the records that were like in heavy rotation that you remember like in that 74, 75, 76 oh, time? Oh, wow. Frame? Good question. You want to go back deep in the crates, huh? Yeah, that's so right. you find those <laughs> records. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you a little history about it first before I can start naming them. But when hip hop was being played and it was certain songs that were being played, other people hear it. Of course, they want to mimic that song in their own neighborhood for their people. Um, one thing about music that's different from how it is now, we couldn't get the names of them songs back in the days. I could remember this to the radio station, to a song that I like, and waited for the song to go off so that whoever's playing the, 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 the DJ can tell you, well, this is by such, 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 and you know the name of the song. If he didn't tell you the name of the song, you didn't know the name of the song. There was no Shazam, there was no no, nothing. Now, with the DJs, when they had records, they didn't want to share what they got. That was their weapon. That was they, what they used to be in competition or used to make things go good for themselves, so to say. Um, DJs didn't share records and songs. So they would scratch off the labels 
of the records on the turntables when they play in the park so no one can read the record and buy the record. They, you might get a glance at the album cover when you pull it out, but you won't get the name of the song. A lot of break beats came on albums too. It wasn't just 12 inches. It was that third mm -hmm. cut on the record that had this percussions that was like crazy on a Dennis Coffey record or something like that. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, to, so, so to say that is to say that in the beginning, no one knew names of songs. Uh -huh. It took years later for us to discover. Like I said, I had makeshift names for records because I didn't know and I just went by what I heard on the record at the time. But it was a lot of uh, original songs. Uh, I just managed different, Dennis Coffey. He had a couple of break records. He was on uh, Sussex Records, uh, Ohio, I think, uh, label. Uh, he had a record called Scorpio. That was, uh, oh my God, it was an instrumental percussion record that had all B-Boys going. He had one called Toast and Jam. He had one called Catch a Groove. We had the Credible Bongo Band, 1970, came out with Apache. We had Dance with Drummers B by Herman Kelly. Um, we had The Mexican by Babe Ruth. And it was so funny, this record, The Mexican, which is so popular, the sample we wrote there, I actually saw a video the day before, no, it was last week, of the female singing that record, original female singing the Mexican. You know, Chico, na na, in the Solomon Gun. I have a, and I never see, and I know Babe Ruth made the record now. You know Babe Ruth, he's a big, fat, heavy guy with afro and pork chop sideburns. He ain't singing that, you know, but the female that sung that song never got, you know, probably you don't know her name, no nothing, but she sung that record, her voice um, just touches b-boys and everybody forever you know every part of that record everything she says to what she's screaming and when she go da 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 all of that i seen the video just, just she was a white lady with nice long hair and when she sang she kept moving away from the microphone and coming back but i was so blown away to see the original singer on video sing that song which came out in the 70s um, these are early hip hop records that I grew up with that uh, played the part of hip hop before it was called hip hop. There's a lot of songs in hip hop that came out before it was called hip hop. Before this whole thing was called hip hop, there was a lot of songs. And don't think that every hip hop song back in them days, as far as in Cool Herc do the Merry Go Round Break Beats, it was just all that. No, there was a lot of songs that just that wasn't even, uh, sometimes wasn't even just instrumental, had vocals and all. Like the Mexican had vocals to it too, that was just a part of hip hop before it was called hip hop. You know, that cool Herc's to play the part, other DJs, years goes to play the part. I remember this record called The Meditation. So old school. It was nothing really, really good about it to me, but it was just a traditional record they played in the park. And it goes back to hip hop before it was hip hop. We had songs that uh, Barry White, Rita Franklin, James Brown, all that that was being played that wasn't necessarily just the, all about the break beats. But like I said, this is hip hop before hip hop. Disco played a huge part in hip hop in the very beginning. I think it played the majority part more than rock, jazz, and other stuff that we use as far as in being involved in hip hop music. A lot of it was disco music. And some of them were disco music without the break parts. I remember listening to Ain't No Stopping Us Now at a hip hop party from the beginning to the end. That record is 12 minutes long. And we loved it. And we still danced. This is hip hop before hip hop. This is 74, 75. You can go out there, you play a record about uh, Eddie, uh, uh, Eddie Kendricks. Straight soulful record. It was just a part of the culture before it became what it eventually became to be. It was a premature part of it before the elements got added. Extra, act, extra elements like rapping and and um you know all this other stuff that came after those first two which mattered to me were the graffiti and the breakdances and the dj those three 
Um, and that life that I live, like I said, pre hip hop, to me, was the best part of this whole game. If you can go way back to listening to the regular radio station, I would say 92, KTU, Paco, the Jesus, whoever. These guys, when they play the radio station, when they play the record, when they played the next record, there wasn't no scratching, there wasn't no cutting, there wasn't even a mix. They always brought that song in off beat, they'll lower the sound down to this and raise this one up, and that's how we heard the next song. And it was perfectly fine, okay. They had a little juggling the beat on the mix, because that was natural. That's what Cool Herc did. He didn't, you know, all the other elements came later. But I can remember listening to music, and then when Cool Herc brought that break beat back, it was everything. It was like, oh, wow, you know? I felt that. And it became, you know, technically has been, you know, uh, strengthened by other DJs to catch it on cue and to mix it on beat and so on and so on. But I can remember before all that was added. It was just your choice of songs. What you played that made people feel good, you know? And then when the rappers joined, they, they, the rappers that had the, the crowd participation was more the popular rapper, you know, because what he was doing to it. You know, he, he had crowd participation. He had crowd motivation. He did everything that made sense to what he was doing. Same thing with DJs. You got to know the records to play to make people do what you want them to do. And I carried that my whole career, and I've been doing good all these years just by my choice of songs. Not necessarily the turntablism or the effects you can do with records, but just your choice. You play the right record at the right time, or you play the right song, you in control, you are a real good DJ. Yep. Do you remember um, you were you you know you were a kid when this was happening, so it might not be as have been as present in your mind, but do you remember like what was Herc's setup that you know, the earliest setup that you remember as far as his system and all goes? Um, he had these out tech speakers. Uh, they were still today. I was six years old when I probably first heard them. I was seven. I was eight. I was nine. I, was six. I heard it in my soul for not just one time, but a whole season every year. So it's something you can't forget or not forget how it made you feel. I'm going to describe how Herc's speakers made me feel. I mentioned to you that my school was 0.9 miles away. Right? That's 229. That's a bridge that takes you over to Real Park Towers. I used to play in the towers with some friends that went to 229 school with me. Saturday morning, probably coming from getting comic books from Florida. I'll stop in the towers. I used to hear Cool Herc speakers when he first turned to play the first record from Real Park Towers Bridge all the way to 0.9 miles, almost a mile away, Central Park, where my building was. Now, me knowing that Herc turned this record on, let me get on my skateboard and get back to my block. You're coming, Real Park Towers? Okay, I'll see you later on. I would get on my skateboard on my ride down that long block of Cedric trying to get to the speakers. I still hear the music. I'm getting closer to the speakers. I'm getting up the block. The sound is still the same sound that I hear it, that it was loud. I went all the way up to the speakers. I mean, basically face to face with speakers. And I'm gonna tell you, I didn't hear not one distortion, not one, the sound, or the, 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 the acoustic of the sound was so pure that I was able to stand up on the speaker and not lose my eardrums. But you could still hear it a mile away. Only thing that will hurt you when you walk up on the speakers, because they were so big and bassy, was when you played a certain record with bass in it, trust me, your heart would skip a beat to that bass standing close to the speakers. That's how hard it hit you. Now I remember this being daring and felt the effect of a bass messing with your pulse <laughs> from them Herc speakers. So that's my memory of Herc's first system. Because I'm going to tell you something, Herc did not 
had a long life on Cedric Avenue. He started there, mm-hmm. but he didn't finish. Starting in 73, that y'all say, so I'm going to go with that. You've done those before that. But Herc's family moved out the building in 79, before 80. After that, he's been, you know, he's been, before he left second, he was already playing in clubs. He he went to play in Bronx River, T uh-huh. Connection. He joined all his other DJs to uh, 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 do parties with, and he kind of abandoned his own block, so to say. But he moved on. He had to go on. He had to take on the world, become who he was, which I give him credit for doing a good job at that, you know. But down on Cedric, you know, um, I will never forget those years, 7 through 79, of hearing your system in that park, you know. And by the time, you know, 79, you know, I was like 13, 14 years old, I was already branching off to other neighborhoods to hear other DJs anyway. Yeah. But it started with him. And I have not heard one DJ up to the day still that has speakers that sounded like Cool Herc speakers ever. Mm. Nobody mind. And I've seen systems. I've been around them Queens guys and all that. They got 400 speakers and all that. Nothing can match that sound that me coming from Rupert Park Towers to 1520 and come up on that speaker and just feel that that speaker did nothing to me. And you can hear just as clear as day. Just as loud as you stand in front of it is the same volume you hear from a mile away. Wow. That's crazy. That is crazy. And we had tall buildings. Not that no building was blocking the path of Cedric because it's a long straight line, but it's just amazing that it can travel such distance and be just as loud as where you stand up on it. Wow. That's my remembrance of Cool Herc's system. Wow. Do you remember um, when the first time you heard the, the word B-Boy was and how people well, explained when the people started to naming the calling giving it a name to what we were doing I can't put my finger on it but exactly when yeah you know everything was trending things was coming and going it was things we were saying that came and left you know before it was called poor, before it was being called b-boy it could have been called the get down or it was called something else you know when these names came in it just came but you didn't know it was going to stick and you know now what names stick yeah, yeah, but yeah. we had all kind of names for it we had our own slang you know, the way we talk, the way we, we describe things to each other, you know. We, we used to say things that was like, only, if you said it then, it was like you were part of hip-hop, you know. Uh, you know, just, kids got their slang now, but we were different when I was, when I was slang, you know. And uh, it was funny because we was always trying to be cute with it. And I say cute with it because back in them days... We 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 knew how to dress. I'm not saying you don't know how to dress now, but you know your pants are sagging. You got all these diamonds on your on your on your, on your um, belt buckles and stuff. Man, we had our names on our belt buckle, okay? <laughs> In brass, okay. <laughs> uh, it was just certain things that uh, the fashion back then was just meant so much to me, and I used to always try to follow. We had these shirts. They was called Terry Club shirts. I used to love mm-hmm. these. Soft fitted, knitted, terry cloth shirts, man. It was just the, the material was so nice. We had uh, certain styles, I should say, that these kids now ain't got nothing on us. I'm sorry. We had real Dita suits, track suits. We had, we had the real uh, clothing that represented who you stood for when it came to hip hop. You know, it got to a point where Timberlands became a, a poster for hip hop, and then they found out Timberland was did not want to be a part of hip hop, so to say, you know? But we had our ways of uh, making hip hop by putting certain things together just from being additional to it. Like I said, we put permanent creases in our pants. Y'all would never do that now. But that was hip hop. That was how we described ourselves as being part of, uh, of hip hop. Getting a patch on, on your back of your pants uh, or on your jacket or, or graffiti on your clothes, that was all description of what, what hip hop was, you know, and some of this was going on before it had the hip hop name, you know. So uh, it was definitely a style that uh, I would say was the best times of, of, of coming in hip hop. Awesome, awesome. Do Do you recall the uh, first time, the first jam you DJ at? I DJ, yes. Yeah, like, tell us well, when and where. It's funny, I've been DJing since, well, I'm going to say professionally. My first party started in 86. Before that, I was just in the house messing around, learning, 
getting the tray because I I seen it in the parks and you know I've been around the DJs. I just never really caught the technique. Uh, I remember my daughter's mother. Yes, I was in high school. And you know I had all that makeshift records and all that stuff before. I still had a record player that's about 45s. They were uh, 79 cents, by the way, back in the days. I was buying my 45s to play records too. I remember moving in with my daughter's mother, my first child, and the mother had ran off, and I raised my daughter, and I had that record player. And then a friend of mine sold me another record player. And they both had volume pitch, uh, knobs on it. So when I went to, and I attached them both to the same speaker. So while this one is playing, this one be turned off, and then I would turn this one up and turn this one down as the mix. Uh, old statistic, 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 old tactic to do when you DJ at a young age. Now, I did a party in my daughter's mother building, right? For the first time, two turntables, some records. It was for the two sisters in upstairs. I sounded good to them. You know, all that beatboxing and make sure and all that kind of paid off. I sounded good to them. So, there was one lady there named Nash. She was a neighborhood lady, so to say. She had number hole. She did this. Sons was doing that. She was doing that. So, she said, yeah, you do sound good. I'm having a pool party in Harlem. You know, once you sound good, I think you can be a DJ. Once you DJ my pool party, I'm looking at her like, serious? Like, I never took no equipment to no party, my own equipment, and, and play my records like in front of people. I'm doing a pool party, and she had to, to trust in me. So I had a friend I worked at a job. I was working on a messenger service, and I was a dispatcher. And I had a friend who sat next to me, named Berger from Brooklyn. He was a DJ. He was older than me, too. So I told him after this party, why don't you help me do this party? I need DJ equipment. Like, okay, I'll help you. Bring your record. So he got me there. I did good at that party, by the way. For the first time, DJ for people. Uh, so at the end of the party, Burger, who got his, he got me there with my records and his equipment, he took his stuff and he left, and left me abandoned at that party. I was put out that party. I was on 15th Street in Harlem, on the curb, four o'clock in the morning, with no ride, with my, with my, with whatever DJ equipment I had. Uh, a female was at the party, saw me. Was you the DJ? Yeah, what happened? They put me out, I ain't got no ride. She had courage to let me use her car, take half my stuff home, because everything didn't fit in her car. She stood out there at 5 o'clock in the morning. When I came back to get her for the second round, the second pickup, the sun was already coming up. But she trusted with her car, and she watched my stuff. Well, I made two trips to get my stuff home. Uh, we later on had a son years later. <laughs> But she saved me for that. And then I found out the lady that hired me to party was her mother. <laughs> Nancy. Love you, Nancy. Rest in peace. Nancy gave me the confidence of I could do parties. Nancy started hiring me doing parties in clubs she used to run. One spot was called Tio's on 174th Street in Boston Road. She had me pay at a couple after hour spots she used to run, stuff like that. But it helped me build up my confidence as a DJ. This is 86, 87, 88. Um, that's the year P EPMD and uh, BDP and everybody started coming out. Rakim, Public Enemy, all of them came out. Slick Rig, everybody came on the album in 88. Uh, best year for hip hop, reacts to me. And I was buying records crazy. And I just caught easy wind of what to do because of my practice years before and then me being in the parks watching other DJs. Ever since 1986, I did that first party. I've been doing parties ever since. Every party became good reports, became networking, became I tell a friend, tell a friend, and I built my own clientele with no promoters, no manager, no nothing. If you do good work, people will use you, period. I play one place, somebody there, oh, give me your car, you sound good. And that still goes on today. So I've been a consistent DJ uh, with no time out, no breaks. Uh, since 1986, I've uh, doing all kind of occasions, concerts, uh, weddings, uh, baby showers, one year old, uh, a bar misfit, you name it, I've done it all. Co uh, company parties, corporate parties, annual Christmas parties for medical centers, uh, I DJ at old folks home on everything, I've done it. Uh, just years and years of experience of 
doing shows, concerts. I, I'm, the, I'm the official 40th, hip hop 40th anniversary DJ. I was open to DJ for hip hop's 40th anniversary in Central Park. The Cool Hurt, Roxanne Shante, Big Daddy Kane, and so on. I was open to DJ for a year and a half. And also, I was the 50th anniversary official DJ when me and Chaos One closed down Cedric Avenue and a big concert there. Uh, uh, free food, free uh, everything for everybody that came because we didn't like the price and what Yankee Stadium was doing for the 50th anniversary with the how they was treating hip hop with all this corporate stuff. So we did a free concert for the 50th the day after on Cedric Avenue, which turned out to be the biggest highlight of my life, big one of hip hop's biggest of uh, uh, shows ever because we had all the acts there from Public Enemy to Fat Joe to. P. Roxy L. Smooth, you name it. Kyrie Irving was there, everybody. It was a pack house. Uh, uh, a real good time for me to be a DJ. But like I said, when I started it, uh, it just took off from there and never stopped. Wow. And KRS One grew up like a little further down the block on Cedric, or maybe. Yes, KRS One, uh, we worked together on the 49th and the 50th year of hip hop. Uh, side by side on a lot of things we wanted to do for 15 to the Cedric. He really became a helping hand for me because um, prior to that, I've been doing things for 15 to Cedric Avenue, back to school events, uh, uh, birthday parties, uh, you know, local things for the building uh, for the last um, uh, several years and more. Uh, Cast One came along for the 49th and, and he helped me live the dream of doing something for that building. Um, we uh, we uh, fixed the building up. We got the building landmark. Uh, not particularly him, but the, the tent association did. I have a, we got a new mural on the building with me on it too, with Cool Herc, uh, Sister Cindy, uh, Cool T, he's the father of Swiss Beats. He also grew up into the building. Um, Mr. Lee is a side DJ uh, from Undercliff Avenue. You know, Shaw Rock, Grand Axe Cash, they all got murals on the wall in 1520. Um, part of some of the work that I've done with BDP, uh, Chaos One, and on the temple of hip hop, uh, we've uh, done some things, and I'm still trying to do things for hip hop uh, for the anniversary of at 1520 this year. Cast one for the 51st, he kind of went left, and he decided to do a walk this way march for the anniversary, and that wasn't the concert thing I had planned to do. But next year, I'm trying to work on make sure we get another concert event for 1520 Cedric Avenue, and um, still much respect to Cast one on his uh, ventures and things he's doing for 1520 as well. Awesome. And uh, when is uh, the next event scheduled for? Do you have forecasted over at 1520 well, Sedgwick? Uh, when it comes to the winter time, and it, 1520 is having transition right now of, of one is being renovated. They have scaffolding around the building, so they're fixing all apartments, the terraces, the whole area, blah. So there's not much we can do around the building like we do every year, because most of the events we have is in the back garage of the building, which holds about 100 cars, and we get all those cars out of there, and we do our events there. I remember uh, many years, I've done events every year, Labor Day weekend, where we have a going back to school event, and I don't want pockets. I would have a balloon castle, uh, a basketball uh, competition, uh, a mat on the floor for a break dance competition. I have a DJ equipment out there. I have prize giveaway cameras, uh, uh, basketballs, uh, 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 all type of t-shirts. I just do a, every year, Labor Day, every year we do an event for 1520. I've been doing it in the back of that building, but now it's under renovation, it's transitional. It's kind of like delaying events to happen. So, uh, this year, we didn't really have a successful event as far as celebrating um, um, hip hop and also our annual Labor Day back to school event. But next year, we have plans for, for both, for the anniversary and for uh, uh, the Labor Day uh, Youth Day, that we call it. Um, 1520 um, have accumulated a lot more visits from around the world lately um, um, since the 50th anniversary. And uh, we've been using the uh, community room as an exhibit for uh, hip hop uh, artifacts and things like that and, and, and giving uh, kids uh, lessons on hip hop out of that community room and uh, we're building up something with Cass One where he can have live uh, televised uh, podcasts at the building um, talking about hip hop and his past and stuff like that. Um, these are things I'm looking forward to doing. I'm also working on trying to fix 1520 up to be what it's supposed to be. I'm trying to get the sidewalk 
uh, fixed uh, with, um, you ever seen them sidewalks in California where they have the glitter inside the cement? And it's like all, you know, it looks real nice. I'm trying to get that on the strip. I'm also trying to get hip, uh, Cedric Avenue to be a walker, a walker of fame or hip hop for all DJs that started. I want to put not stars going down the block like California, but turntables going down the block every five feet and describing the DJs from Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, Theodore, all the way down the block like a walk of fame with DJ that started this hip hop. I'm working on that too. I'm also trying to get a gold lamppost because, you know, they got um, Elvis Presley, uh, Elvis Presley got, uh, what's that, what's that place he got? The some mansion he got, um, Elvis got, Presley. Um, he had some kind of mansion or what's something. It called? It's in Memphis. Yeah. Gra Grace. Gracie something. something. Grace Land. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Graceland. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Gold lamp posters. Gold, you know, and everything was decked out to what it stood for. That's the image I want to give the birthplace of hip hop, the landmark. And these are these projects I'm working on currently to, to make a change and make it a difference. But we can't really do much until after that building is completed with the renovation and uh, the scaffolding is down and, um, and there's work, more work to be done. To, to preserve and also to just as an education to hip hop uh, moving forward it has to be some type of script or a book or something knowledgeable for the people to know the life of, of 1520 before hip hop became hip hop and when we're starting um, on that block um, there's plenty of people that grew up in the neighborhood with Cool Herc that has stories too to tell about the, 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 the beginning and the original part of 1520 and Cedric Avenue and, and what, what we did to keep it going and to where other people wanted to get involved and also eventually started doing what they were doing in their neighborhoods, what we were doing in ours. Awesome, awesome. Is there anything that we didn't ask you that, that you would like to share with us about 1520 Cedric and any things you got coming up? Well, um... 1520, there's a lot of people that want to do things for 1520. A lot of them come kind of connect with me in this sense because of the work I've been doing in the past. Um, there's no way going around it kind of because the tenant association I'm, I'm, I'm embedded with, they, they like to work with me on a certain thing because they know I know the history of hip hop. And it seems to me I'm the only one from the building, got all these people that I know, that's really into putting out information about our building. Uh, I'm not saying it's pulling teeth to, to reach out people that, that, that live there and have their own story too, but they kind of wait for me to open the door for them to step in and tell their story. Uh, once that platform is set, I'm sure I can get a lot of energy from, more energy from people that knows about hip hop first days, that's slight older than me that can tell you stories, but you know, they're not going to move until they feel that is an easy way to go about it rather than having to do this, do that, call, talk to this person, call this person, get this permission, all that. They want to just walk in, say what they got to say, and walk out, you know? Um, that easy, but I'm here to try to set the, the platform, and hopefully in the future I have something that's big enough that can um, get people to speak more about the knowledge of 1520 uh, beginning. Um, I would like to share that I already mentioned that it was like a unity in our community that we all were together and there was no violence, there was no gangs. Uh, uh, a lot of people kind of, it's hard for them to believe that in the 70s that my block didn't have a gang. They feel that every block there was a gang for protection, whatever, on every block. We didn't have that. And I had to prove that to some people from the other side of town that, 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 was heavy into gang and try to tell me there were gangs in the neighborhood and it wasn't. They even went as far as in Googling it and what was the gangs on Cedric Avenue in the 1970s and sent it to me. It had a gang called the Cedric Sisters. And I laugh because I never heard of Cedric Sisters. But I had to remind them that Cedric Avenue goes from 168th Street up the Mishula Parkway. All the way up here, yeah. The Cedric Sisters was in that 174th Street, 1520 Cedric Avenue. If there were such a crew, they would probably further north, Fordham, Mishula Parkway, some way up there, right. which is a little distance. 
from what's going on. Because Cedric, we're the beginning of Cedric. We on like 174. Cedric starts around 170, 169, right where that precinct is after mm-hmm. highway. So um, I knew it wasn't us. But yeah, we had a good, clean hip hop. And I just want people to know hip hop did not come from poverty. It didn't come from abandoned buildings. It didn't come from dirty mattresses, abandoned cars. It came from a, a, a community that had unity and loved each other. And we taught that lesson to all neighborhoods. And you know, honestly, what I see today, I see all neighborhoods doing it together. Y'all present each other with awards, community awards. Y'all giving recognition for doing this. Y'all even giving each other links to excel in the business. Y'all even giving another brother out of you to go do this before some miles get it. Other neighborhoods are doing what we started with doing for each other. I love that. I, I got to see that because it went from y'all being violent and being gangs to all y'all being organized and being good people to each other and looking out for your neighborhoods. Now, I can't say my neighborhood is together like we were years ago. We might have started unity in, community, in our community with hip hop, but we're one of the worst ones right now of having unity. But I take it as we didn't keep it in our neighborhood, but we had it reach other neighborhoods where it kind of mattered probably more because they had gangs in their neighborhoods because they didn't know how to get along. But now I tell you, I see all my brothers, Soundview, we talk about the Zulu Nation and, and Bronx River, they organized. These are all people that could have been on another level, but they chose use hip hop to be organized. They chose hip hop to teach brothers to be righteous. They chose hip hop to show brothers how to dress or how to present yourself and not necessarily be something that's uh, violent or lead to trouble. And I, I, that's where I get off at. I know my neighborhood's not the best, but for what we start a neighborhood to, to, to overcome the violent stuff of other neighborhoods, to organize and, and do for each other and give each other awards and recognize each other, I think that that's a big part that's being overlooked as far as hip hop being started on 1520 and the effect it had on other neighborhoods besides the music. And yeah. You know, we, li- we like to ask one last question, you know, everyone, you know, what does the Bronx mean to you? Oh, wow. That's a nice question. Good question. I would tell you I wouldn't change it for the world. Some people say they try to break off, try to say Brooklyn is, is not even New York, Brooklyn is Brooklyn. You know, they try to say Harlem ain't Manhattan, Harlem is Harlem, you know. One day about the Bronx. No matter where you at the Bronx, the Bronx is the Bronx. See the difference? Harlem, they not Manhattan. Low East Side, they call themselves LES. They don't call themselves Manhattan. You know, they, they break themselves off. Brooklyn totally just took themselves away from us. Like, we Brooklyn, we got nothing to do with New York. We, we Brooklyn, like, you know? <laughs> the Bronx will always be the Bronx, no matter what. And what I love and learn about the Bronx is that we one unit. Um, just from the news, whatever I see information from, how people grew up, how people live, California, this person grew up in Hawaii, this person grew up in North Carolina, it's nice and all that. I've seen all their glory as far as I'm growing up. I still will never change where I came from and how I grew up from nothing nothing I don't even want to know how when y'all learn hip hop I don't want to know when y'all start doing this I know what I saw and what I learned and that means so much to me because I caught the beginning and I didn't catch the beginning when I was too old and I didn't catch it when I was too young I caught it right where it mattered so that way here in 2024 I'm still able capable still have my mind to know what happened rather than I'm too old for it and don't have interest in it or I'm too young I don't quite remember I'm right there and it played a major part of my life to where I wouldn't want to change that for the world I don't care if I never really give an interview to anybody about what I live or how I live because you know where it really counts it matter in here because I'm the only witness you know to what I saw 
And it, that's what it, it made the man who I am. And I can't see myself growing up in any other neighborhood. You know, on the West Coast, they was gang banging, you know. Uh, down south, they, they, you know, they had they ways with cartels and all that stuff. Um, the Bronx, though, it was always just New York City. Bronx, New York. It was never separated. We never said, I'm from Bronx River. I'm from Cedric. I'm not from the Bronx. I'm from Cedric. You know? That's like saying, I'm, I'm from Buffalo. I'm not from New York. <laughs> you know? Like, you you know, it's, the Bronx always been one unit when all other barbers around me was kind of separated, separate who they were. You know? And um, I just love the Bronx for from day one of being a kid and coming outside and having the luxury of hand music Friends, uh, we had an ice cream truck that never left the block. Or get there, park and right there, and never left to nighttime. We had always had uh, each other to entertain and talk and have fun. And we talking like 12, 1 in the afternoon to 2, 3 in the morning. We talking 14, 15 hours outside. You know, ain't no eight hours, you know? And we, 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 we did that. And what what can you be doing in 14 hours in a bar when it's just music? How much fun did you really have? The honest answer, too much fun. Too much. Just among each other. Dancing. You had girls turning rope, doing double dutch. We had uh, a little basketball thing on the side. We had a bench we could talk and laugh. We had girls braiding other girls hair. Sometimes the guy they get his hair braided because he had a lot of guys with afros back in those days. But we just entertained each other. You know, we were we were uh popular at chewing gum and and, and um you know getting the free gum out the baseball packet and and just 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 living life, you know, before it became easy for most now because y'all y'all, y'all got a good now with, the, with the phones and the technology and now AI and all this stuff. We didn't have all that back then, you know. No one could talk to me until I got upstairs. You wanna call me, you gotta wait till I get home to call me. I'm outside, there was no connection nowhere. Uh, um, I, that kind of like the respect, that's kind of the way my mother liked to carry. She, well, before she left, she carried on her old ways. She never wanted to uh, move up into the upgraded stuff. She she wanted the rodeo phone. She I don't want all that press button stuff. I want the rodeo what I was used to doing. She didn't. Uh, her, her her phone cord went from the kitchen all the way straight to her bedroom. Okay, could we share one phone? <laughs> yeah, you ever had that long cord went from the kitchen all the way to the back to her bedroom? That one long cord she was talking and she would call me, Jerry, what? Come and go hang this phone up. And I would come, grab the phone up, and go over to it. takes you to hang it up. Yeah. 50 foot cord. Yeah, yeah, long cord. We, we did that. So we didn't, we didn't have the event, but we, we loved each other. We talked to each other. And uh, that was the, I think that's the best way to grow up as a kid in your life, to be surrounded by a community with love and togetherness and music and um, friendly competition. And everybody dated each other. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell it. It'd be Kim and, and, and Mike one week. Next week, it'd be Kim and David and Mike and Debbie. And then it'd be Debbie with Craig and Craig is with Kim now. And they all kind of like stuck with each other as far as day. And it was so amazing to me because it was so much compassion. Everybody just loved each other. And, you know, and I guess they kept it in the neighborhood. And they were all teenagers. They were young, you know. Like I said, we had clubhouses. We had... 18th floor, so that's a long stairwell right there, you know. Uh, it was just so much fun. And graffiti was uh, part of the game, too, because I remember a lot of the tags and stuff in the hallways and the, uh, the, the gifted artists that used to write. And I did my little graffiti, too, back in the days, too, up to high school. But uh, it was just all in fun of the game. And uh, I wouldn't change nothing for the world at all. If I had to die, come back to life, bring me back to Cedric Adams, 1971, in the park with who was. And, and I'll be good to start all over. And this time, I make sure I have a camera with me. I make sure I have a book, <laughs> book and pad and everything so I can document everything so you can really see the truth behind it rather than, you know, we didn't have access to stuff like that and take pictures. I, I give credit to Joe Conzo, who's a famous uh, hip-hop photographer who caught a lot of uh, classic moments in hip-hop history uh, because he had that camera, which uh, all neighbors should have had and, and caught 
um, some of this untold story on, on, on camera and um, and I'm just upset that no one from Cedric uh, played that game and we don't have any pictures or documents of what we were doing in 72 and 73 in the park and, and, and that's what it counted because that's what kind of started um, to start something that built to be something so much big and I didn't see it coming I didn't you didn't feel like it, you know. When they played, I remember when they first heard "Rappers Light" on the radio. I was like, "They playing on the radio!" Like I couldn't sleep for days. Like, oh my god, we we on the radio now. And the commercials now. Is it is it Utah now? Is it Wyoming now? Is hip hop is everywhere now? And it was so crazy because I couldn't picture that. It was like no way in hell, no way. In hell. Once they were able to put it on records from the streets, that's what really changed the game. This, and the only way they could take what we were doing in the streets and put it on record is we put what we was doing on the streets on a record. And the only thing we were doing in the streets were bringing them break beats back, those parts of those records that made you go crazy and extended it to a longer version of that short thing. And they just took it and they ran with it. And, and, and look at it today. It just It made a whole different world. That everybody's involved with. That's why I said I wouldn't change it for the world. Cause I seen it before it happened. I see when it happened and, and how it happened. And like I said, I didn't have my camera in that. Now I didn't want one yet. And I said, should have had it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. For the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project, that was DJ Jerry D. Thank you, my brother. You're thank you, Dr. Stephen Payne. And thank you, Pastor.